Ontario's 2023 budget promised a new provincial park slated for the township of Uxbridge and Oak Ridges Moraine on the edge of the Greater Toronto area. It's been described as an urban provincial park that will span more than 500 hectares. With us now on what goes into planning a park of this magnitude, in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Lee Podman, Director and Assistant Professor at Lakehead University School of Outdoor Recreation, Parks and Tourism. And here in our studio, Dave Barton, Mayor of the Township of Uxbridge, Tim Gray, Executive Director at Environmental Defence, and Mike Hendren, Ontario Region Vice President at the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Hi, everybody. Hi. It's very nice to be talking Hi. about parks. I'm a huge park geek every weekend. My family is out on a nature trail of some kind. And I guess we should say this is a proposal. Nothing is set in stone. Uh, but Mayor Barton, you said I could call you Dave. Oh, you please do. Okay, yes. because I don't want you know, your constituents to watch me and be like, she's very rude by calling you Dave. Yeah, and just, you know, in, in Oxbridge, <laughs> if you don't call me Dave, then, then I'm a, I'm you, you won't be fully accepted. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll just throw in what your worship. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's less socially acceptable, just so you're aware. <laughs> All right, I'll pose the first question to you okay, because perfect. obviously this is happening in Uxbridge and it must be very exciting for you all. Um, it's good, It's been called the first ever provincial urban park. What makes it urban? And we're just creating this right now. So this is the very first. So I think we're we're sort of flying this plane. To, <laughs> we're uh, we're piloting this plane as, as we fly it. So it's exciting. It's very exciting. We're very excited about how this is going to work. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the reason why we're calling this urban is it's not one big parcel of land. You know, there's not a a park ranger with a jeep and a hat. This is this is lands that are all around our municipality. They weave in and out of other conservation lands, other houses, other farms, other commercial properties, mm -hmm. and they just happen to be protected like a provincial park. Well, what makes it different? Because I think I've been in that area. Because um, yeah. uh, people can go there and walk there right now, right? Can't uh, they? So on the trails? Not, not in this area. So mm -hmm. the, the lands that we're talking about with this this park mm -hmm. have been closed. They're, they've been fenced, no trusting signs. Now we have some people that know the secret way to get in, <laughs> but my guess is you probably never hiked on these lands. I know that up until last fall, I'd never been on any of these properties before. Okay. So the vast majority of people in, in Uxbridge and certainly the vast majority of people in Ontario have not ever set foot on these lands. Well, we did invite um, Ontario Minister of Environment, Cons Conservation and Parks, David Piccini, to the show. He was unable to come, uh, but he sent us this statement. Our, our government is introducing a new classification of Ontario Park aimed at bringing these opportunities closer to home for people and families in and around Toronto. Uxbridge is a trail capital of Canada. It is situated just 45 minutes outside of Toronto and is centrally located near Toronto, Durham Region and York Region, making it the perfect spot for Ontario's inaugural urban park. Um, how accessible would you say it is for visitors without cars? So it, uh, go, the go uh, bus goes right by. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we will create some stops that so people can step off the, the go bus right into the park, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. And then it's it steps from my urban downtown, which again is, is uh, we have Durham Region Transit go right into Uxbridge and we also have go. So lots of ways to get in. Mm -hmm. It's extremely accessible for my residents because almost every house is within a couple hundred meters of a trail in Uxbridge. Mm -hmm. So you can go from one trail system right into a right into a provincial park. Okay. And Mike, your organization, Nature Conservancy Canada, is one of the groups that would work with the government on this project. How would the uh, process look like with this collaboration? Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's part of what we've been doing for almost 60 years. We mm -hmm. started, we were formed really as an organization to help uh, create new conservation uh, areas and spaces in in Canada and we started here in Ontario mm -hmm. and really recognizing that governments of all levels can't do this alone. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, the, it we're a private sector solution uh, really to, to public sector challenges, right? So um, our interest is to help where we can. There's a lot of great uh, energy already on the table. Some of our major donors, I think of John McCutcheon, who's actually donated his property, he was looking at maybe donating it to us. It made most sense in this case to donate it directly to the town of Uxbridge. Um, and so we've been working to, to, to enable that. Uh, we're also, uh, the lands that the provincial government has put on the table are significant. We may help with some of the assessments uh, of what's there and, and management plans, bring some of our expertise that way. And we're also chatting with a number of private landowners in the area to see if there is some interest in, in selling properties or donating. We know there's a couple already, uh, and that's voluntary, of course, um, but uh, we're looking to help where we can. 
Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're excited about, about helping. Uh, we certainly applaud any move towards um, more conservation and more park space in Ontario. I think we all know after the pandemic, the biodiversity crisis, COP15, everything that's happening in the world, adding more protected land in the space. And certainly in Ontario, where the population continues to grow, uh, this is a good thing. This all sounds terrific, because um, I think when we were dur during the pandemic, when we didn't have access to public spaces, uh, I think a lot of people realized why they were so important. Um, and this sounds like great news. Uh, the new urban park was announced on Earth Day. Um, the government said uh, it was a major step forward for conservation and biodiversity pr protection in Ontario. This is what the minister said. Um, Tim, what do you make of the timing of this announcement? I think it's great. I mean, uh, I was saying to Mayor Dave, it's really nice to see a new protected area established in Uxbridge. And of course, in Southern Ontario, we have a biodiversity crisis here. You know, one of the richest areas in the whole country is Southern Ontario. And so anything that we can do to protect more area is obviously really important. But I think people need to remember that uh, the tiny scale of this relative to what this government has been doing to attack biodiversity conservation uh, in the province, um, if you just think even just the size of this particular area, it's about 500 hectares, might become a little larger. Less than 10% of the size of the area directly adjacent to the Rouge National Urban Park that they've removed protection from, um, and much, much smaller than the attacks on the Greenbelt overall. And of course, there's been broad scale attack on uh, planning protection for wetlands, natural heritage conservation authorities. So I really do think that uh, the government is trying to um, put something uh, a bit more positive um, to the public of Ontario around uh, conservation and protection. And that's a good thing. Uh, we should take full advantage of that and get these areas established. But I think it's really important for people in Ontario to realize that overall, that this provincial government has been attacking biodiversity and conservation overall. Uh, what concerns you the most? God, it's hard to say. I mean, the economic consequences of this are huge. Um, the attack on the planning rules means uh, really an end to uh, farm communities that are going to be able to provide us with our food in the long term. Um, the attacks on the green belt send a signal to the development community that you can buy up land, drive up the prices, make it harder for farmers to conserve it. Um, changing the rules around wetlands mean the loss of the very few remaining wetlands that we have in southern Ontario. So it's devastating both from a biodiversity conservation perspective, uh, a quality of life perspective, an economic competitiveness perspective, and a food supply perspective. So it's pretty devastating, uh, the policy agenda of this government um, uh, in terms of these issues. And I'm really, really glad to see that um, organizations like the Nature Conservancy or um, the town of Uxbridge is actually able to get something positive uh, from this government, and I congratulate them on that. Well, well, Lee, Tim brought up some of the concerns around this, and um, you know we are living at a time when we're trying to um, balance the scales for housing, um, protect the environment because once it's gone, it's gone. We also need food in this province. Again, the pandemic highlighted the need for our, this province to be uh, kind of self-sufficient. Um, and I'm guessing when these decisions are made, there's a lot of planning that goes around it. Uh, there's 115 operating provincial parks in Ontario. Lee, what goes into the development of a provincial park? I mean, I think I'll, we've been sort of hinting at what happens, right? And anything where we're talking about the government, uh, you know, taking land, trying to uh, protect it, you're going to have conversations with key stakeholders, uh, community involvement, environmental assessment, uh, conversations with Indigenous communities that are impacted by these decisions. And But certainly, I think, there is a political will element to this, of course, and I really appreciate the points that were just made about uh, this current government holding this up as a great success of theirs related to the environment when they are doing so much to devastate the environment uh, within Ontario, biodiversity and, and other places. So it is, you know, quite a bureaucratic process, of course. Uh, but for me, I'm always interested in the social implications. And I share the sentiment that this is a wonderful thing for the people of Uxbridge. I will acknowledge as someone from the north, I've never been to Uxbridge. And so those contextual people 
pieces have been important for me to hear about. Uh, really thrilled whenever people can get to access parkland. Love that they will be accessible by public transportation because that is such a huge barrier to accessing parks. Um, but I also share the sentiment that this government we should not applaud on the whole this government. They have definitely a failing record when it comes to the environment. Um, I just wanted to follow up really quickly. You mentioned that mm -hmm. what concerns you the most are social implications. What are those? Mm -hmm. So for me, when I think about this, again, coming from a different context within the region, coming from Northern Ontario uh, on the shores of Lake Superior, the big piece that came out of this budget was the government's plan to rely on an extractive economy, and that is related to the ring of fire in the north. And many Northern Indigenous communities have said that they support the ring of fire development, and many others have said they absolutely do not. And this government is doing nothing new in terms of the decisions they're making in terms of economic drivers, it doesn't show me that they're thinking about the way our economy and then therefore our social life related to the economy uh, should look like as we move through climate change. And so for me, I worry about I worry about food access. I worry about, you know, I have children. I worry about their ability to live their lives without environmental disaster. Uh, what does the next pandemic look like and how are we prepared to deal with that? And I'm not trying to sort of inflate that and be... Um, dramatic, I guess, but these are dramatic times and the dis the people that are holding the power right now, I don't trust. So I uh, love this and I love it for the people of Uxbridge and in the bigger, broader context of this, this government, I just feel concerned. Uh, Dave, I don't want to put you on the spot and be like, well, what do you think, Dave? Um, but having heard um, what everybody has said and their viewpoint on it, um, you know, this is going to benefit your town. Is this something that uh, you prioritize in your campaign? Is this something, like how do you see this benefiting the people in your area? In, in many different ways. You know, certainly the access to additional green space is important for the Township of Oxbridge, for my residents, but also for the residents of the GTA. You know, we're just 45 minutes outside of the GTA, accessible by public transit. Um, again, I, I watched your show last night. It talked about how- On Ontario Place? No, I know the one about uh, about trees mm. and about how when you're close to nature, you're healthier both uh, mentally and physically, and it really changes how healthy you you are. Mm -hmm. um, that's important. We need people to get outside in nature. We need to we need to introduce all the the new people that are coming to Canada who are settling here in Ontario. Mm. They need to really f experience what it's like to be surrounded by nature. You talked about yourself and your family. Whenever you're out in a provincial park, it's, it's a reset. It uh, prepares you for the, your next day, prepares you for uh, the, your, your kids for their education. So that's that's sort of where I'm at. Mm -hmm. um, do you, but when you hear some of the concerns, do you uh, for, worry about that too? Or? So from an environmental aspect, again, we are a farming community in Uxbridge. Mm -hmm. um, we are completely in the green belt. We're part of the Oak Ridge's brain. We're uh, protected by the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. You know, pretty much every provincial policy is limiting growth in the township of Uxbridge. Um, so what we are concentrating on mm -hmm. is sort of being the playground of the GTA. We are the you know the best place to live, work, and play. But we're also a great place to visit, and that's what we're. This will this park will make a huge difference mm -hmm. for my community and for our economic development when it comes to tourism. And Mike, you know, the federal government has dedicated $3.5 million through Nature Conservancy Canada to protect habitat and biodiversity within Ontario. What have you been working with? Yeah, well, no, I think it's a great question. Both federal and, and currently this provincial government uh, has established the first uh, uh, private land uh, conservation program uh, that we've had in this province two years ago, the Greenlands Conservation Partnership, which is something we as a Canada's largest land trust and all the other 34 land trusts in Ontario are able to access. And we actually, this was 20 million over four years, announced in late 2020, and an additional uh, 14 million added in the budget just announced last month. So we've got all kinds of plans. I think we've shared some of them, uh, certainly. Is that with, enough? Because it's a lot of numbers. There's a lot to do, but we things have ramped up quickly. Uh, and yeah, it's definitely a huge boost. Um, we're, we're matching this money with with, with private and, and with the federal. In fact, the feds have just renewed over three years, 90 million across Canada. And so a, a decent chunk of that will land in, in proportionally in Ontario. So we're matching federal dollars, private, some municipal as well. 
and certainly private dollars uh, on the table to deliver conservation. A couple examples, uh, Batchewana Island, which is the largest island in Lake Superior, mm. a little bit away, closer to Sault Ste. Marie than Thunder Bay, but we do have a number of projects and, and actually team members in Thunder Bay, great community. You kind of uh, jumped ahead because I was gonna bring that up. I apologize. Um, <laughs> why are you buying all this land? Well, I think, you know, as we've discussed here, there is a biodiversity crisis. We know that many species are in peril. So as an organization and, and with our partners, we've identified, we have a, you know, a, a, a all across the country and certainly in Ontario, in the Carolinian zone of Southern Ontario, 25% of, this, of uh, biodiversity exists just in this part of Ontario. I mean, mm -hmm. we're also the stewards of the, the Northern half uh, or uh, at least the Canadian side of all the Great Lakes too, right, in this province. So we have a huge, um, uh, opportunity to, uh, with a lot of those coastal wetlands and coastal areas are the host of uh, many of these species. And so uh, it's important that Ontario show leadership. And I think actually this is the opportunity we're seeing now with this increased funding. Um, the program, uh, I'll just say that you've mentioned Ontario's uh, pr protected uh, provincial parks. But we have a pretty significant and com uh, complex protected areas system in Ontario. We're the only place in the country with conservation authorities, which are kind of a quasi-government agency. We have the largest uh, sector of land trusts, groups like the Bruce Trail Conservancy, Georgia Bay Land Trust, Kawartha Land Trust, who are all really strong public mm -hmm. sector or private, um, private and third sector players. So there's a lot of opportunity, a lot to do here, and I think there's a lot of momentum coming right now. Well, Tim, you've been hearing what Mike has said. Um, <clears throat> do you think that the government, the this province is doing enough to conserve land? Oh, no, clearly not. They're going backwards uh, on land that is privately owned and publicly owned. Um, I think scale here is really important. So about 10% of Ontario is protected either as provincial parks, conservation reserves, private uh, reserves like those held by NCC. Um, we have a target uh, that we committed to in the international arena to reach 30 by 30% protected by 2030. In seven um, years. Yeah, right. And we made we added 0.1 percent last year across Canada. So we have ways to go. We have to ramp ramp everything up. And uh, as Mike was saying, like that requires investment both in private land conservation, but also in public. So we cannot afford to be going backwards on the policies that protect land outside of these smaller protected areas. Mm -hmm. So you think of Southern Ontario. If you change the rules to encourage cities to sprawl instead of building houses inside of them, if you reduce the protection for wetlands, forests, uh, reduce the power of conservation authorities to do watershed level planning, then you can expect broad losses of biodiversity and the other impacts that are associated with that. More flooding, more risk, uh, more farmland loss, less food availability, all of those horrible things that are uh, go with rolling back those rules. So. That's kind of the, the situation that we're in, and we can't expect um, organizations like the Nature Conservancy focused on private land acquisition, as important as that is, to have uh, the ability to conserve biodiversity across the entire landscape. Mm -hmm. It just won't work that way. We need everybody to work together, and the <clears> province, <throat> unfortunately, is really falling down there. And I think what's really important to remember about this, too, is that everyone who has any experience and expertise in this issue has said repeatedly that this um, undermining of environmental protection has nothing to do with building housing that we can uh, either access for the average person or, or be deeply affordable for those who can't afford market level housing. Uh, the province's own housing affordability task force said we didn't need to touch the green belt. Uh, an association of the regional planners said the same thing. Uh, Kevin Eby, who used to be the head of planning in Waterloo Region, did his own report. There is no evidence to show that the existing land that we had available for building houses couldn't meet that the target that the province has set. So then the question becomes, why is all of this happening? And I think it's very clear, it's the ties between the sprawl development industry and this particular provincial government. You mentioned Mike, so I'm gonna give you an opportunity to just come to you, but um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit and just push back um, because we know we're in a housing crisis in mm -hmm. this province. And sometimes I think it's um, the immediacy of people finding the importance of finding a place to live. Exactly. How do you balance that with, you know, some people might say, oh, this land is available, we can build on it. But how do you balance those two things? Yeah, there's not actually a balance there. I mean, I'll just give you an example of this, is that right now in Toronto, we're having a debate, it was actually at uh, City Council yesterday, 
um, about whether or not we should be uh, allowing houses to be built inside of the city of Toronto. Fourplexes, uh, small apartment buildings, the kind they used to build on my street where I live in downtown Toronto up until about the 1940s, and they've been banned ever since. Mm -hmm. We need greater density. We need to have people's homes built where they can access public transit, where they can walk, where they can bike. The idea of taking the finite labor resources and uh, natural resources that we have to build large monster homes far from the city on places like the Greenbelt, when we do have a housing crisis, especially affordability crisis, like I don't know anyone who either doesn't have rich parents <laughs> or is like in their 50s that can afford any house anywhere in this province anymore. So if we're gonna fix that, we need to build houses in a manner, in a form, that are accessible, that we can afford to build uh, as a city, and we can afford to pay the taxes for as individuals, and we can afford the mortgages for. And that isn't building a monster home on the green belt. Uh, Lee, I'm going to come to you uh, after Mike, because I'm really curious to see your viewpoint of, you know, you're outside of this GTHA kind of bubble. Uh, but Mike, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond. Oh, well, I think just to say, you know, obviously as, a, as an organization in our sector, really, the land trusts across Ontario, uh, uh, we're very much optimistic and, and future forward about what we can do and, and hopeful for what we can do around conservation. Um, we're working uh, proactively with every level of government and every stripe of government as we always have um, to, to look at all opportunities. I agree that there are a number of contributions that the, the province can make in, in public uh, conservation. And I think some initiatives that are underway that we're working on uh, with this government and with other levels, uh, we're hopeful around some larger public commitments uh, to conservation. And let's, let's not forget, 87% of Ontario is crown land, is provincial land. So they have a huge opportunity to dedicate that. And there's a number of uh, sites that have already been designated or um, identified uh, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, so there's an opportunity there that we're working on uh, to move some of that percentage point as well. And, and frankly, we're re really ramping up our private land conservation in those really critical uh, areas. We actually host um, habitat for uh, approximately half of the species at risk uh, in, in Southern Ontario, just on our sites alone. So, uh, and we hope to increase that over the next few years uh, <coughs> rapidly. And Lee, you're based in Thunder Bay. Um, I know uh, Ontario is not a monolith, right? It's a very diverse uh, province. From your viewpoint, uh, w when we talk about housing and we talk about provincial parks, what are some issues faced by provincial parks, natural habitats, and wildlife in Northern Ontario? Oh, wow. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have two things uh, thinking about housing now relative uh, to the GTHA housing in Thunder Bay seems quite affordable. So if you're coming from the larger market and trying to buy here, um, it's easier to do. Though people who live here are earning their incomes here, we have seen the skyrocketing of our housing prices at as well. So that interregional difference, uh, we've noticed folks uh, that now have remote work are buying houses in Thunder Bay that actually work for companies in the GTHA. And uh, so they can buy a house here, live here, but work effectively work in Southern Ontario. Um, I hinted a, or I talked a little bit earlier about the Ring of Fire, which I'd love to return to, but I, I have a thing that's been bubbling in my mind related to uh, the mayor's comments about access to the park in Uxbridge and particularly related to newcomer Canadians. And I think it's really important that uh, governments and decision makers look at the research that's out there related to the type of recreation that newcomer Canadians uh, in urban centers want. I think the, the transportation piece is really important here, but there was a report released in the last couple of years called Race and Nature in the City. Uh, one of the authors of that is Jacqueline Scott, who is working out of OISE at U of T. And the, a lot of the assertions in that report are that newcomer Canadians identify nature in a different way than settler Canadians. So we identify nature and wilderness as something that is out there. It is a destination. It is dense forest. There's no one around. Um, this sort of solitude that uh, idyllic, what seems like idyllic to a particularly white settler Canadians uh, is actually unsettling uh, as identified by some of the youth uh, that were part of this study uh, because of the remoteness, not because of a fear of wilderness necessarily, but because of a 
fear of other people and how they might be perceived as racialized people in that environment. And so actually parks of an urban nature that have access to this, again, the report identifies this. Um, I'm thinking of a park like Christie Pitts, which is a municipal park in Toronto that has access to barbecues and other things where people can gather with their extended family. That is a priority uh, for folks in urban environments. So again, I'm not saying that this park in Uxbridge has to like check all those ticky boxes, but if uh, governments are serious about wanting, you know, newcomer Canadians and di diverse groups of people to access parks, then we do need to look at the research and there is research happening. That did not answer your question about the North. <laughs> and so I'm, happy, I'm happy to do that, but I sure. really needed to get that point in. <laughs> you've, you've got one minute. You've got, go ahead. <laughs> okay, cool. yeah. So, I mean, the challenge that we have in the North always is that we are different. And really, Thunder Bay is the middle of, of Ontario. Uh, we are not the North. We are geographically the center. And we are the South for many communities north of us. So those folks come here and access resources, whether it's you know hospital, medical, social, work, economic. Um, and our concerns here, my concern here lays in this, in this, the ideology that underpins extracting resources from Northern Ontario to fund a government that wants to decimate the environment in Southern Ontario. And this is an old story in Ontario. It builds resentment in the North when we are seen as a place that resources can be taken from to support what is perceived the economic driver in Southern Ontario. And I think that this has not been done. Uh, the, the consultation involved here has been very challenging, but the government really held that economic development of, of resource extraction in the North up as, you know, this is what is happening. And that's very concerning for me from an environmental perspective, from a social perspective. And it just continues to divide Ontario. We are different, but I don't think that we need to be, um, yeah, I don't think there needs to be so much division between, between us. And we are always perceived as having more land and more space, but that doesn't make it any less precious or important. Um, I, I, I saw a lot of nodding here. We have a few minutes left. Does anyone want to jump in really quickly before I read uh, another portion of the minister? Can't resist because... I, I love Northern Ontario, and I, you know, would, uh, I, I live in Peterborough, so it, you know, it's not the North at all. But it, some people think it is, and that always makes me laugh. And similarly, <laughs> I, have, I have friends and family and, and colleagues in, in Thunder Bay, so a shout out there. But uh, you know, we've identified certainly the whole shoreline of, of Lake Superior as very significant, and because it's it's really provides a lot of Southern Ontario biodiversity, but at a, a much bigger scale. And we acquired it in Hearst, which is basically due east from you, uh, the largest private land conservation deal in Canadian history, uh, twice the size of Toronto. So there are opportunities in, in the North to work with, uh, and, and we see ourselves as an ally to an Indigenous uh, communities and governments as well. Uh, there's a great opportunity in the North we see uh, to do things that you can't do in the South. But And I agree that it is uh, absolutely, there, there's misunderstandings about the, the difference, but uh, both are very important in the context of Ontario. And I encourage anyone to do what I did, which is drag your family across uh, Ontario for a summer vacation. It's a long way, but it's a wonderful place, and it's very rich and diverse. It's so it's so beautiful, this province. Uh, we do have another email response from the minister uh, when we asked him about cons consulting with Indigenous communities for this park, as Lee mentioned, the importance of it. Um, this is what the government said. The government has also reached out to all Williams Treaty First Nations, and the minister has had a number of positive conversations. Consultation will kick off soon through a posting on the Environmental Registry of Ontario, and we look forward to engaging Indigenous peoples, businesses, nonprofits, and the broader public further about what Ontario's first ever urban provincial park will look like. Lee, you mentioned the importance of consultation. Um, what's the importance uh, of the of Indigenous sovereignty when we talk about land conservation? I think this is a really interesting question because to me, it seems like we are trying to make up for the transgressions of the past. And so we should but there is something complex for me about the fact that this entire country is a colonial project that involved taking land away from Indigenous people, whether through, uh, you know, various treaties and questionable foundation for some of those treaties. And then now we move to a place where the government is going to consult with the people whose land it actually belongs to in the first place. So of course, consultation has become essential. People, the government recognizes that they uh, can't do these things without consultation. And 
I just find it, it's a very strange, like if one, if humans could live for 200 years and you could have been here 200 years ago and then here today, I think you might be having some kind of a laugh or tears related to the back and forth here uh, about taking a la- taking land and then saying, we're going to give it back and we want to consult with you. So I just find that to be something a bit strange where we're at. Although I welcome returning Indigenous lands to Indigenous people and see these calls, see this as a solution or or some step in the direction uh, when it, we're talking about land back and and more Indigenous sovereignty. Well, Dave, you know how do I, it's weird calling you Dave, Mayor <laughs> Mayor Barton. Um, how how does uh, the province and local governments hope to involve Indigenous communities in the consultation process for this park in Uxbridge? So. Uh, I know, you know, with conversations with uh, the minister and ministry staff, this is extremely important to them. I know those talks have already begun. Mm-hmm. Um, the municipal government is is not part of those discussions. We're we're also someone who's speaking directly to the province. So okay, and we've got about thirty seconds left. Tim, uh, looking forward, looking towards uh, moving forward, how do you hope to see changes in terms of protecting and nurturing Ontario's nature spaces? Yeah, I mean, I really do think that there is opportunity on the publicly owned land to advance a more aggressive conservation agenda. The federal government has stepped up with uh, a lot of resources. Um, They're committed to consulting with indigenous communities on creation of new protected areas. I hope the province steps up. I really would hope that the province rethinks its attack on biodiversity in Southern Ontario and focuses on building homes and cities and helping make them affordable for people and that uh, they stay out of the green belt because um, probably 90% of the population in Ontario wants them to do so. Thank you all for such a, an interesting and engaging conversation. We really appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.